Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good, good evening in Romania. We will start as the hours or starting hours arrived, and probably we will wait for other um, attendants to to connect with us during during our uh, symposium. So, uh, for those that do not know me, I'm Cosmin Dumitrescu, and I'm going to be your host during the works of the symposium uh, today. And uh, welcome everybody to uh, the medical science and biotechnology, Romanian American scientists beyond the limit of innovation for curing the incurable online symposium. This is the second conference in a series of five that the Council General of Romania in Los Angeles, together with partners from the civil society, with universities, and with other institutions from Romania and the United States organized in order to mark the anniversary of the 10th year since the signing of the joint declaration for the implementation of the part, uh, strategic partnership for the 21st century between, between the United States of America and uh, Romania. So welcome again. And I want, I would like to thank to each and every one of you for taking our invitation and, uh, to, uh, and to, 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 to send many thanks and special thanks for our uh, partner in organizing, uh, this one for, uh, Renashtera foundation from Romania. Um, we appreciate what you're doing there and we appreciate your support in organizing this conference. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marmurano for accepting our invitation and allow me to say uh, several words about his career for introducing him. So Dr. Alexander Marmurano is a prominent board certified thoracic and cardiovascular surgeon with special expertise in the field of minimally invasive surgery where he pioneered and developed several techniques and procedures. In his 30 years of practice, he has been able to successfully treat some of the most complex and challenging heart and lung conditions with high rates of success. Dr. Marmuranu completed his general surgery residency and research fellowship at the New York University Medical Center, NYU, in New York City. He continued his surgical training at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, where he was actively involved in the field of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery research. He completed his cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, in 2002. He continued to practice as UCLA faculty before joining Cedar Sinai Medical Center and also becoming a director of several cardiothoracic surgery programs in LA. Dr. Marmuranu is nationally and internationally recognized for the field of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery and has authored numerous research papers and clinical publications active both in local and international charitable causes, Alexandru donates his time for traveling around the world to train local surgeons and perform pro bono procedures. He has appeared as a guest speaker in numerous TV and radio shows where he discussed the benefits of cutting edge surgical techniques as, as well as advantages of minimally invasive surgery for thoracic and cardiovascular patients. Dr. Marmuranu maintains a busy and active cardiothoracic surgery practice in several hospitals where he performs more than 400 surgical cases per year with outstanding results. He is a member of a well-recognized well, well -recognized organizations, boards and committees, as well as invited speaker, visiting professor, both nationally in the US and internationally. Dr. Alessandro Marmuranu, thank you for joining us today. You have uh, <clears throat> first of all, thanks for having me. It's a great honor. It's uh, actually it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. And I'd like to thank to the Consulate General of uh, Romania in Los Angeles, mainly Cosmin Dumitrescu, who's a dear friend, and he's done an amazing work here in Los Angeles. It's uh, it's much appreciated. He was able to be extremely instrumental in bringing the name of Romanian Romanians forward, and it's it's a great honor to have him here in Los Angeles now. Diana Loretta Pawun, the presidential advisor, I'd like to thank her very much for helping to set up. And uh, obviously, last but not least, Mihala Joana, dear friend, her and her brother. I know them for many, many years from Romania and uh, Buenos Aires in Los Angeles. Um, 
Vreau să spun că am avut un pic, uh, uh, m-am gândit complicat. I had, uh, I had a few thoughts in regards to what I should be talking again, because uh, there are a lot of great presentations, very stimulative, I must say, Adrian Bot and everybody else, as well as the, the uh, director from Târgu Mureș. My first job after residency was at Târgu Mureș. I have very good memories about that place. Um, actually, it was Târnăvenă, then Târgu Mureș. You know, I got promoted. So it, it's a great, great camaraderie, great group of people. I'm extremely proud of being Romanian. I feel totally privileged growing up in a country like Romania and having a chance to practice in, in the States. And I have to tell you, like all of you guys, thinking outside of the box helped me tremendously in, in my surgical practice. Um, now, my presentation, what I want to do, I want to put a bunch of pictures and videos, keeping a bit more entertaining in such a way that combine the science with, with my daily activities. So I want you guys to see what I do every day. And obviously at the end of the presentation, which I understand shouldn't be too long. I truly believe that a good talk is a short talk. Um, go ahead and ask me any questions or you know how to reach me on social media and so on. Um, all those things being said, let me share the screen with you guys and uh, see how we can get this thing going. Um, so, so basically, what are we going to talk about? Minimally invasive cardiac surgery. It's heart surgery, it's lung surgery, minimally invasive. We call it here maximal torture. The less invasive, the more difficult it is for me as a surgeon. Now, this is the UCLA Medical Center. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but my office is here somewhere, Suite 410. And I've been here for 20 years. I, uh, I train in... Uh, in New York, NYU, New York University, Mount Sinai. 2000, I came to UCLA and I'm private, uh, private practice. So, like I said, a good talk is a short talk. That's me skiing. We're gonna move really quick. Again, memories from Predel to Sinaya to Poyana. Um, and I'm still doing it, you know. It's, um, I truly believe that a doctor, surgeon should be well-rounded. And uh, when I don't ski, that's what I do. I'm in surgery and those are my surgical loops, you see. They're probably two and a half to three and a half power magnification. You see there is a headlight. It's, it's not a coal miner. Uh, Lumina e calaminer, dar de fapt este, it's there to see you in the chest. You see I'm making an incision in my, on the right side of the patient. This guy here is taking the vein for what's called cabbage. And cabbage nu e varză, cabbage stands for coronary artery bypass grafting. So it's open heart surgery. You see there's a whole team here. Like Adrian Bot said very well, it, it's a team approach. I got probably 10, 20 people in each hospital. I go to six hospitals and, um, and that's the way it should be done. Now, um, this is after I opened the chest. Actually, this is the end of the operation. Um, you can see this is a vein graft going to the right corner. The heart is what's called a heart lung machine, the bypass machine. This is an aortic cannula coming at the top. Um, and at the bottom is called a venous cannula. Uh, Cosmin, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. I can see your so, cursor. Yes. It's, it's black. It should be in red, but it's, it's, we can okay. follow that. So this is. The, the, this is the heart, and this the view is from the top of the patient. That's the way the anesthesiologist looks at the patient. This is my right hand. I'm here on the side, on the right. Patient stands on the right. The chest is open. And you see what I do to have a motionless field. <clears throat> in other words, I mean, we can give this talk in two, two hours, but it's going to be 20 minutes a day, so we have to rush a little bit. But the bottom line is that all the blood is taken out of the patient through this venous cannula, this that goes to a heart lung machine and is getting back to the patient through here. This is an aortic cannula. This is the heart. So I can actually do my work on the heart. Um, and this is the view from the right side. This is what I'm looking at. Um, this tube here, what it does, gives potassium. Potassium is like poison. It stops the heart from moving. The reason I'm saying that, because we do this every day the same way, and when I first moved here, I said, my comment was a bit cocky, you know, like um, we said, well, every day the same way, no progress. Well, if we do it every day the same way, where is the progress? Well, we do have some progress in terms of now we operate on a beating heart. 
Um, basically, let me go to the next slide. And now you see the heart beating. It's, that's the heart back there. And what you hear me, it's you actually see some of the graphs in here. And the memory graph is an artery taken from the chest to all placed on the heart. And this is called a Doppler. What it does, it verifies the sound that there is blood flow through those graphs. A sort of you want that sound. You want to be sure that you did a good job and obviously the patient, it's, um, it, it's doing better. Uh, clearly, it looks somewhat barbarian. It probably, if you guys uh, figured out by now, the chest is open. There is a big retractor in here. The question is always, can we do better than this? Now, this is the gold standard. So um, we're going to go in a few options that was very instrumental in helping developing. The truth is nothing wrong with this the way it is, but can we get it better? Minimal invasive. Minimal invasive, one of the classifications, first of all, having the patient on a heart lung machine is not physiologic. In other words, basically, you don't need those tubing and the heparin and everything else. Patients don't tend to like this. So if you can put them if you can do the surgery without having them on a heart lung machine, you're better off. They're better off. Beating heart. Now, second, less invasive, is smaller incision. You saw those big incisions here. You're looking at that, you know. It's, that's, it's probably a 30 centimeter incision in here. Less invasive, less of an incision, yeah? So, one of the classification is where do we go from here? Well, mini incision, direct vision. So, you saw that sternotomy back there. So the option would be now to do the same thing through a smaller incision, much smaller, doable. You're not going to be able to do three or four bypasses, but probably one or two. With a small incision, patient tolerate better, faster return to back to work, they recover better, so that's one way to do it. Next thing is direct vision. Do you remember those big loops? Okay, Larco Lupe, you saw the headlight. <clears throat> that's the way I'm looking. The next part is video assisted. What do you do? You assist yourself with a video camera. In other words, you put a video camera and you see whatever you can see through the, your incision, smaller incision, I must say, and whatever you can see, you have a video camera. Interesting, this video camera has got a 30 degree angle. So it's not like this. So what you do, you see around the corners. In other words, it's much easier to see angles and you move it in your hand. The next part would be, the next step up would be robotic surgery, which allows you many degrees of freedom. Now, small incision, direct vision. Micro incision, video assisted. Port incision, very small, video directed. What that anymore. And we're going to go through those slides. I do all the operations looking at the screen, looking at the TV, just the way you look at your soccer game. I look at the TV, that's how I do my operations. Next part, level four, port incisions, robotic instruments, video directed. What does it mean? I tell people, why do I make big incisions? You saw that stenotomy. Look at me, I got big hands, okay? I got to put my hands in the chest. Now, if I don't have to put my hands in the chest, much smaller incision. So the robotic device has two metal wrists, small. They imitate the motion of the human wrist, and they go in the chest. So you're basically outside of the patient chest, you're, up, you're inside the operating room, but not touching the patient. And the robotic device is inside of the patient and does the work the way you're doing it. So that would be level four. Um, now, you, do you remember that big incision up here? That's actually a mitral valve repair replacement. See, it's a small incision right below the nipple. It's called a mini thoracotomy. So again, it's not up here, it's here. It's much smaller, yeah? So. This is actually the surgeon looking into the chest. You see this? Smaller retractor, you see the heart back here. The problem is the heart is not in the right chest. The heart is basically in the middle. So you see there are a bunch of sutures that I place in to bring the pericardium and that's where the heart leaves in the pericardial sac toward the right side. You bring it towards you. Well, what do they say? Mohammed comes to mountain, yeah? So basically you bring it here and you see better. Now, how much can I see through this small incision? Not that well. You see, I have the loops, I have the light. 
I have a video camera. This video camera is a five millimeter, and I don't want to take too much time. We're actually a few minutes into this conversation, but talk. But this is a actually a robotic arm, you see? So there is a video camera in here. It's called a 30 degree. You see around the corners. I have it in. So how do I do? I look inside through here, and I look up on this screen. This is an old older video, see the screens are a bit older. But the idea is the same. It's a funny story is that this is a robotic arm. Initially, we used to have a resident, a fellow, some sort of person holding the camera, and usually they fall asleep because they've been on call all night. So they shake all the time. So you can't really have a stable platform. So we start working this robotic device that holds the camera and it's voice activated. You see, I have a microphone and I say in, out, up, down, left, right. The problem is at that time, the Dragon, the voice recognition system wasn't that good. And obviously I have a Romanian accent and it's got a little trouble. So you keep trying there and sometimes doesn't work that well doing what you're telling. Then we tried to invent a device to put a cursor in right underneath the headlight. In such a way I move my head forward, backward, left, right, the robotic device will do it. Again, this is not, doesn't have the wrist, it just holds the camera. So the problem, we kept to moving our hands in the UR like this, so it looked a bit crazy, and the camera still didn't do that well. So we kind of got rid of this, and we moved to, this is a better picture, we moved to different softwares, but the idea is still there. You can see the heart through here. As a robot, the initial has to go into robotic surgery. Now you see a little bit better, there is still a retractor in here, the heart is coming up, this is the video camera. As you can see at some point we got rid of the robotic device, this is just a platform, stable platform. Um, what's the issue here? You still have a, what's called a thoracotomy, much smaller incision between the ribs. The 3D visualization, the way we look at it is 3D, uh, three-dimensional, three-dimensional. When you look on the screen, you see only 2D. So you would like to look 3D all the time because when you place your instrument in the chest, the problem is you need to know how deep you, you can go. So 3D is definitely helpful. Small incisions, they're limiting range of motion. So it's not much that you can do, but the most interesting part is it's called a fulcrum effect. In other words, when you put your instruments in the chest, you see, I have to move the tip the tip, sorry about that, the tip to the right. I'm sorry, the handle goes to the right, the tip moves to the left. So if that's the chest, it's a bit of counterintuitive motion. So in a pure robotic procedures, you don't have that. So we train our residents the step learning curve to basically master this motion. Not to mention it's the same way like signing your name, holding the pen up here. It's not a because you're used to hold it here. So it's all a steep learning curve. Now, you're going to see here next what I'm seeing when I'm in surgery, and that's a mitral valve repair. So you can see the mitral valve, which is the valve in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Um, it's defective. I'm fixing it. And you can see I'm putting a repair ring. So we can do a replacement. We can do a repair. This is the repair ring dropped into the valve. This is called a nut pusher goes in and basically secures the repair. Just to brag about, about how smart the Romanian Americans are, I actually have a patent on this, on changing the shape of this ring. Because what happened is you place the ring, close the patient up, six months after, there is still a leak in here somewhere, just because the ventricle remodels. So whatever was good now, six months to an year, it changes the shape and you can have a leak. So I have a patent on on using radio frequency ablation and actually putting wires in here and changing the shape of the ring to eliminate the leaks, the mitral valve leaks, regurgitation, without having to go in and operate. Now, this is not happening yet. This is just an idea. We still have a lot more work to do on it. Um, going back to small incision. Now, you see there is an incision here. That's the mini thoracotomy. The head of the patient is here. There are bunch of trocars are called. And that's where you duck, is called the robotic device. Those are those sutures that earlier were bringing the heart toward me so I can see better. This is the camera port, camera goes here. 
Um, the arms, the left arm and the right arm, those are robotic devices going here. That's why I'm going to do the operation. I'm going to look through here. We also inject carbon dioxide, CO2. <clears throat> and that's basically what happened in the opera. First of all, everybody, like Romania, they're professors. Everybody's an expert. This is the surgeon doing the operation. Outside, you see, it's not touching. The patient is here. Those are the big robotic arms. This guy is called, he's a bedside surgeon. He looks in for a small incision to be sure you want somebody at the bedside, nothing goes bad. There are screens. The, the surgeon, again, does not touch the patient. We actually done a case from Mount Sinai from New York, was the lab Coley, and the patient was in France. So you have six to eight feet. You have two, three meters in between. What stops you from having six miles or 60 miles? So this device, is the robotic device has been designed initially for the army and imagine that the the patient is let's say in afghanistan even though the americans are pulling out now and the surgeon is in los angeles so the paramedics place the arms in afghanistan and you can go and click in your robotic device in los angeles do the surgery and you see everybody again it's an expert wow put a stitch here put a stitch there so you have an audience now um New technology. Now, it's not easy to sew with those robotic devices on a beating heart in special insights. So, in the interest of time, I'll go a bit quicker. Those are magnets, yeah? So, you see, this is an artery. It's called the memory artery that gets placed into the heart. This is the heart here. So, you have magnets here, magnets to the heart, magnets to the artery. So, instead of hand sewing the anastomosis, you actually just click it and stays there. That's one issue. Second, and actually that's the way it's being done. That's the artery on the heart. Those are the robotic wrists coming in and you see the magnets up and down being applied to the artery. So the, this is the LAD on the heart. So the mammary artery comes in and, and, and clicks into that area. Right here. Um, and you see the way the robotic arms, those are, so my hands are moving and the robotics arms are moving the same way. Even more interesting, it's very hard. Now, if you have a, a sort of raw motion, you do this, uh, it's fairly easy. But, you know, when you saw the sutures are so thin, you can barely see them with the naked eye. So what we do is like you dial the radio in your car. So we, we decrease, so in other words, if I move my hand 10 centimeters, the end effector, the tip here, will move one centimeter. So you can dial down your motion so to make it more precise. Otherwise, it's very difficult to do this job. Um, this is robotic. We're not going to go much. It's called AFib. I have a bunch of slides. We're not going to spend much time on AFib fibrillation. That's how you treat it. We do ablation, so that's how we ablate the pulmonary veins, putting catheters around and using a robotic device for the dissection. Um, Epicardiolite, same thing, it's just sort of like a, um, a uh, you know, for a pacemaker, uh, the robotic disarm, you can see it, they imitate your human hand motion and they get placed on top of the heart. Uh, we can also do this with thoracoscopic, uh, basically, instruments, and I'm going to get there. Um, we're the time. This is, again, the same motion. We're going back to the open surgery, and you see a little video. This is a cross clamp, and I'm not sure if you can see very well. This is a dissection. This gentleman, aorta tore. See, the whole thing tear. And you see there is a graft placed up here, replace the whole ascending aorta. Young guy, by the way, trauma, car accident, the whole thing tore apart. He's done very well. And you can see the graft up here. Um, now, again, what can you do? How do we do better? You, it's very important. You see the incisions are quite small, no more median sternotomy. You have the uh, small incision. It's very important, actually, where do you place your ports? Your port, how do you get in with your thoracoscopic instruments or robotic device? And that shows you in order basically to be able to get to the correct vessels and harvest everything. So we do this in a minimal invasive way. We harvest the vessel, then it's a small thoracotomy and the 
anastomosis done on a beating heart this time, the old way, no heart-like machine. And those are actually pictures from surgery, from the operating room. Um, and again, we, we don't talk about the median sternotomy anymore. It's all about minimal invasive, and that's a chest tube. This is probably one or two days hospital stay after heart surgery. Um, and those are some of the instruments you see because the heart is beating inside. As you can see, uh, well, you can't see very well, but trust me on that. This is a, it's interesting. We worked to develop this device. Initially, this area is being placed on top of the beating heart and the vessel that you're sewing, your anastomosis is right here. And the way we started, I think it was more than 25 years ago, I actually took a fork and I cut the middle tooth of the fork and I had a resident pushing in with the fork with no middle tooth so I can sew the anastomosis quick on a beating heart. And we were giving a medication to slow down the heart because if it beats like this, it's crazy, it's fast. You have to be really fast, but if you slow it down, it's a bit easier. So now we don't use a fork anymore. We use this device that's actually compressing the heart this is called here a starfish, but what it is, it's a suction device that gets the tip of the heart and moves it around that allows you to, to access the vessel. Um, you see the difference. This is a median sternotomy. Nothing wrong with this guy. He's going to deal well. Other than the incision, it's not that great. He's got some keloid versus a mini thoracotomy in here. Um, this is me in surgery, and that's how I look in the OR. And then I'll show you how I look outside the OR. There's a bit of a difference, but that's what I do every day. You see again the loops and the headlight and, uh, you know, obviously the patient. Um, the next step is called VATS, Video Assisted Thoracic Surgery. And what that means, instead of doing those big incisions, we're looking at TV. Look at it. This is the right lung. Actually, this was done last night. I got out of surgery at 12 o'clock and... I want to show you guys some fresh pictures. If you can look at it, the, there is a video camera right in here. There is no incision. This is the upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. This is the lung. So the whole operation is being done while I'm looking on TV. I'm not looking anymore inside the patient. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. All right. So I, I am on the basic left side up. The patient is facing the other way. And that's the way we do it. And that's a bigger, that's a different view, sort of panoramic. I have a few screens. This is the anesthesiologist, no incisions anymore, right upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe. As you can see, the visualization is quite good. Um, I like this picture. It's an older picture, but what I'm looking at, you see, I don't have any sort of glasses, loops, lights, and I'm looking to the chest. How do I do this? With the video camera. So that's our buffer. That's what we use. This is, by the way, it's called a pleurodesis. People with cancer, they accumulate fluid. We drain it. We put some powder in. We scrape the pleura so the fluid doesn't come back. This is the same thing, thoracoscopy, epicardial lead placement. The heart is beating. Open the pericardium. Be sure you don't put a hole into anything. And interesting enough, those leads actually, they are being screwed up. We should have been leads. We, we have a way to screw them into the heart. Um, and you're looking at it. Um, changing gears a little bit, you know, this is again, it's me and my girlfriend climbing Matterhorn here. We're going to move to a different topic. So, again, that when we don't do surgery, we actually try to play a lot of sports. And um, changing gears, really quick, I don't want to take much of your time. Ablation, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a huge problem in the States and in Romania, all over the world. And in the interest of time, quick, what we do, there are pulmonary veins on the right side, on the left side, coming to the heart. So if that's the heart, pulmonary veins, right, left, you will have to have a device, a clamp that ablates, and this is the clamp. Allow us to use radio frequency ablation energy in order to interrupt the signal from coming from each side toward the heart and create atrial fibrillation. So the treatment would be, again, permanent isolation of pulmonary vein, and that's the way it's being done. And those are those ganglia, ganglionic plexi on the right and left. What they do, they send the signal to the heart. Heart fibrillates, not a good thing to do or to have. You need basic anticoagulation, 
complication, one to 3% per year, so on and so on, people don't function properly. So if and when our colleagues from electrophysiology, they do the same thing going through the heart with wires, they're not successful, that's the next thing we do. Radio frequency ablation through a minimal invasive approach. Okay, this is the same thing, how we do it, we map pre-op, we map post-op, and then we document that we've done a good job. The left part of the heart, the left atrium, has almost like an ear, it's called an appendage. And that area creates clot in there. And that's the biggest problem, the clot from there goes to the brain and creates a stroke. So what I do, you see it here, there is an instrument like a scissor that cuts and staples, cuts and closes at the same time. On a beating heart, you actually resect that area. So as you can see here, there are no more clots because the whole thing is gone. You also do this, you take a deep breath because you hope your staples are working well. Otherwise, you look at the inside of the heart, and that's, that's not a good thing to, to look at. Um, some of the complications, other you have a lot of complications, but it's a good procedure, and we do it quite often. Changing gears again. I like the race car. As you can see, this is Pikes Peak. You can't afford to have complication. I encourage you guys to read about Pikes Peak. I actually played in a movie there. It's a heart surgeon doing this race. Um, uh, but they have no guardrail. So if you somehow miss a turn, you land in a different state, in a different area. So it's, it's a, it it's, has to be precise. It's all about hand-eye coordination. Um, talking about complication, being careful, this is what's called a pericardial window. You see there is a hole in the pericardial sac. I made this hole, by the way, because there is a lot of fluid here compressing the heart and the heart is not beating. This was a longer video, but I cut it. You see all this fluid. The fluid is what it does, actually. It's, again, compressing the heart, not letting the heart beat properly. So you put this hole in here, and basically um, they'll, they'll tend to do better. Um, I'm toward the end, and we also do vascular surgery. This is the aorta, okay? Those are the head vessels going up. This is called the arch, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta. We frequently put stents here. We used to do everything open. We still do it open, but we put a lot of stents in here. So the, the reason I got this is that it's going to be hard for you guys to see, but when people have kidney failure, they put what's called a uh, dialysis catheter to dialyze them, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. Unfortunately, this patient, it's a very sort of crazy case, interesting. The dialysis catheter should be placed into the neck, into the vein, into the groin, anywhere. This time they put it not even in the carotid artery, it was placed straight into the aortic arch and into, into the aorta. So it's, it's, it's a quite a problem. You see the video, this is the catheter coming into the aorta. I mean, this patient can die anytime, can exsanguinate. You see it's a tube that goes in. It should have been in a vein. Uh, it's into the aorta to going toward the heart, quite a sizable hole. So those are things that I do every day. You have to figure out a way to take it out minimally based or open and be sure that the patient does well. Um, this is a better view. This is actually a pacemaker coming from the left side toward the heart. And this is the catheter who missed the vein, missed this what's called the inominate artery, got straight into the aortic arch straight. It shouldn't be here. That should supposed to be in a vein. It's in the aorta going toward the heart. So I had to take the thing out. Um, that's how I look when I'm not in surgery. And that's my girlfriend, Laura. So we, uh, I'm involved in a lot of charity events and we do a lot of charity in Hollywood and Los Angeles and that's a uh, night out in town. And uh, let me see what else I got. I told you it's going to be a quick talk. It wasn't that quick, but thank you again. And um, I appreciate you inviting me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Marmurano. Uh, I must say that I'm a little bit speechless. Uh, I knew the level, of your professional level, and what you're doing, and uh, I read a lot about your work, and I must confess that I'm one of, uh, I'm, I'm a fan. I was just thinking, did I lose you guys? You're speechless or we lost connection? I mean, I couldn't hear anything. I, I was speechless, but now I'm, uh, now I'm speaking up. <laughs> I hope that you can hear me. 
Can you hear me? I think you're very well, guys. I really appreciate you. And, and, and again, thank you. And it's just, I'm so always happy to be invited and uh, keep in touch with, uh, uh, with my Romanian friends. And it's, it's a great opportunity. And I hope you do it again, because again, it's a, it's a good opportunity for all of us to keep in touch and um, hopefully share the information and, uh, and help the new generation, you know. Yes, Alex, we will, we will certainly do that again. And uh, uh, the intention of, of the Council of Romania is to organize smaller events and putting together universities from Romania and students and professors from Romania with you and uh, not only with you, Alex, but with you uh, Romanian American specialists here. And we are very grateful that you agreed, already agreed to to get into contact with them and to teach them uh, many of your techniques. Uh, that's one of the solutions for Romanian research, and we highly appreciate that. Uh, well, I, must, I must say, I must say, Alex, that that uh, uh, it was very interesting to see how technology is used uh, and how automation is used in performing modern surgery, heart surgery, and thoracic surgery in general. And that gives me the opportunity to to pass on to the next uh, to the next speaker. That is not an MD; uh, he's a physicist. As a matter of fact, we, the next two speakers are going to be two physicists that are very uh, um, well involved with their research and uh, their professions and teaching and teaching methods into the uh, uh, the medicine. So uh, uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Radu Moldovan, and we will continue, Alex. We will continue. Uh, the dialogue in the Q&A section, because I'm sure that many of the people in the audience would like to, to ask you questions. There are a lot of doctors there. I'm not going to ask you any questions because I'm a PhD, but in a deep, whole different field. So, <laughs> but there are... Well, say, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, it's not a good thing to interrupt the, the, the Consul General of Romania, but I will. I want to give a lot of credit. I just got to... Text message from uh, Dr. Azan Fire, and I want to thank you very much from uh, Turgumura. I look forward to coming back to Turgumura and operate with you guys. But I do want to, you know, I practice in probably the best centers in, in the world. I mean, you talk about NYU, Mount Sinai, UCLA. But I want to give credit to the Romanian School of Medicine. I would not have been here today if it wouldn't have been. My parents were physicians. My sister is a doctor. I train at Craiova. And I must say that. Going to medical school in Romania, I had a lot of role models and mentors. Professor Petr Georgescu was the dean. Um, Dan Mogos, a general surgeon. Uh, Sher, uh, um, Sherban. Uh, I always wanted to be like those guys. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, there is nobody in America I want to be like. I think they want to be like me, but I couldn't find a role, med a role model and a mentor here the way I found in Romania. And Romanians are very, very good doctor. They're very good surgeon. They're very skilled. They're smart. I, I would like to reemphasize that I would like to come to Romania, but I don't feel that I necessarily need to teach. Those guys are very, very good. What I think we need to do is collaborate and cooperate and, um, and again, give them credit of who they are because they're very good. Perhaps with better technology would be perhaps a better job. Technology would help a little bit more. But... Let it be understood that a very good doctor the school is out there, and again, I'm very proud that uh, I'm part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Nobody could put it better than you, than you have just done. What do you think okay. that's the main challenge for medical sciences and for medical professionals after the pandemic of COVID-19? I think the biggest problem would be vaccination to convince people. And by no means I'm saying don't force anybody. They have freedom and don't want to do it. They shouldn't be getting it, period. However, they need to understand that it's very hard to restart and reintegrate in a lot of structures. And I'm talking about hospitals, nursing care, nursing homes, etc., cetera, who is not being fully vaccinated. So to me, that would be at least that's what we're dealing with right now. And after this, there are a lot of other issues, but that's the most important part, I think. The influence oh, in oh. our daily life of overuse of antibiotics coming from foods as well as usually abuse of excessive utilization of antibiotics in our field. And I, I believe you can go first and then we'll continue with some other perspectives if that's fine. Well, I think in our field, I think there is 
to a certain degree, there is excessive utilization of everything, antibiotics including. I mean, you want to talk about CAT scans, you want to talk about labs, you want to talk about God knows what. I mean, you know, even surgical procedures. Almost everybody I know between 30 and 50, they had surgery. 20, 30 years ago, everybody does. However, going to going to antibiotics, yes, they they're overutilized. And what we decided to do, at least in my practice, we get an ID, infectious disease specialist, that's going to basically guide the medical management. Um, but again, that comes down to education. It comes down to people feeling comfortable in their daily lives with what needs to be done next. So uh, with all the things being said, I'll let the next speaker go on. Well, I'm off the phone, and I'd like to reemphasize Mihaila's point about education, if I may. Um, you know, we say here that little knowledge is worse than no knowledge. In other words, if you know Dr. Kucine, my road they can ask you the lock and took a secret savanta, my professor. So I think education, uh, it's very important. And um, I don't want to say anything bad, but uh, we, we have those issues here in regards to people that they, they, uh, they're not following the, the party line and the rules and so on. So um, I, I fully agree with Mihaela. I, I'm not sure if I can see a, a hand raised by Professor yes. Daphine Moreshano. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I have a question. Can Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. If yeah. you can ask who. Okay. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's Adriana. Uh, I'm a rich yeah. I'm from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Uh, it's It's more a comment and and just uh, voicing again what. Uh, Actually, um, uh, Dr. Radu from UCLA, Caius Radu said, um, uh, regarding uh, partnering with uh, with uh, academia. So uh, I think seven years ago, I was very naive, and I was trying to uh, establish a collaboration with uh, with uh, uh, Professor Maya. Uh, uh, Simonescu at the Institute uh, in Bucharest, which is a very famous in Institute of Vasculature Diseases, and Adrian Mania, and we wrote together a, a grant, which we submitted to the NIH, and I was naive enough thinking that we're going to get funded, and we weren't funded, and uh, unfortunately, that collaboration stopped right there, and I'm very sad about it because I would have loved to work uh, with these people. That institute was established by uh, the late uh, George, uh, Professor George Palade just across the street, Rockefeller. So I was very naive then. Now I know that that's what I have to do. But now I want to ask uh, uh, um, our surgeon, the Morishan from, from Los Angeles. I don't think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, killer number one is really heart uh, disease and um, I don't know if I don't know of any companies that will fund what we wanted to do. We know today that um, for our cancer patients, now we have survivors that 10 years after uh, the, the great, those, those survivors will suffer from cardiovascular disease, be it from radiation therapy, be, be it from, cardio, uh, from the chemotherapy. And there isn't much we can do for them. Is there any company that will, that I can, start again to work with this institute in Bucharest, which I would love to work with and try to do something about these patients. Any suggestion? Are you asking me? Yes, you, yeah, well, I no, mean, I can ask you because you're a surgeon, but still, I think you're, you're the most qualified. I think unless anybody else jump in, please jump in. I, I you know, listen, I like to think I'm qualified. Jump in, anybody. And, I like to think for the vote of confidence, but I think probably Mihaela John is more qualified than I am because they raise more money. Um, this is an ongoing problem. This is an ongoing issue, lack of funds and uh, for different research. So it's an ongoing competition. I can tell you this is a, a well-known issue and it's coming from New York to LA to Romania. Yeah, nobody in particular, you know, um, as you know, a lot of part, uh, well, I mean, I can tell you that, first of all, 
Memorial Sloan Kettering is a premier organization and a great center. And I think probably you should reach to, to the foundation. And at the end of the day, you got to go and present your work and find some, uh, some donors that would uh, be able to support, uh, support a project. You know, it's not an easy task. And I, I know. wish you best of luck with that. Yeah, there is a competition everywhere. But that's what I'm saying. I'm just bringing it about because I started this uh, in uh, a long time ago with with Maya and, and Adrian Mania, and it got stuck. So now I know where I'm supposed to go, but still I cannot identify one company that will be interested in this. In I our think research. it's a dual responsibility, if I may. I think you have to find the appropriate people in here, and then perhaps uh, our general counsel can help in Romania. Perhaps they can do part of the job. I'm sure there are people that are be willing to step in. The talent in Romania is, is really, really amazing. And uh, this type of cooperation, international collaborations and so on, are uh, a cornerstone and a key for development in any field, uh, science included, any kind of science. If uh, there aren't any other questions, uh, as in Europe, uh, we are pushing the midnight right now. Uh, I would like to, to, to express my gratitude and to, to thank uh, and every one of you for attending uh, this uh, online symposium. I really hope and we really hope that it met your expectations. And uh, we are looking forward to having you again with us for the next symposia and conferences and uh, scientific communication that we are intending to organize. Uh, we will we will maintain this kind of multidisciplinarity approach and, uh, and of course, uh, the international environment and participation. I would like also to, to extend my gratitude to Fundacia Renaștere and to my partner, Mihaela Joana, that helped uh, with uh, uh, organizing uh, this uh, amazing event. I was expecting something very special, but uh, it exceeded all any any expectations of mine. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, waiting to uh, looking forward to to have you again as guests of the Council of General of Romania and of any other institution uh, of Romania. We are here to support you. We are here to build relations, and we are ready to make everything that's possible for you to be more proficient and more efficient in your work and, of course, in working with Romania. Thank you very much.